Welcome to Primary today. We're going to start off with an opening song. Our opening song is Faith from the Millennial Mormon Mom YouTube channel. lesson today is covering Ether chapters 12 through 15 and we're going to start by watching the video from the Book of Mormon videos scripture project YouTube channel. Welcome to the Revengers, the tragic tale of the Jaredite self-extermination. So for centuries the Jaredite power cycle drives men, fathers, sons, and brothers to battle for revenge and the throne. And finally, we're now at their last king, Coriantumr, educated, cunning, and power-hungry, who sits on the throne as the uncontested king over a very wicked people. But enter Ether, the son of two generations of captive kings and rightful heir to the throne. And if anyone has the right to revenge, it's him. But either chooses to fight for God, boldly preaching all of his days to repent or be destroyed. Yes, Ether preaches, believe, and have faith in God. But the vengeful Jaredites refuse as they can only see with their angry eyes. And now, Moroni for the first and last time interjects. Future readers, hope for a better world and keep anchored to God by refreshing your faith. As the waters will get rough, yes, have faith and believe in unseen truth. Doubt not because you can't see, and here's the best part, but once you have faith, you will see with spiritual eyes and do amazing things. Okay. Most people love superheroes. So here's a question. What's your favorite superpower? Invincibility? Strength? X-ray vision? Well, here in chapter 12, Moroni shows us the three things to be an actual real-life spiritual superhero with awesome real gifts and powers today. First, our hearts hope for God's better world. Next, our mind truly believes in his special promises to us. And third, we move our feet and do good works. And doing this, we're given the eye of faith, like x-ray glasses, allowing us to see ourselves, others, and life the way God does. And when we see with the eye of faith, we act in faith. And this, as Moroni teaches, is when we see real miracles happen. And now Moroni projects the Faith Hall of Fame reel with Alma and Amulek leaving Ammonihah, Nephi, Lehi encircled with fire, Ammon converting the Lamanites, 
and the brother of Jared who saw the Lord. Yes, could we not want the super powerful and real faith? But now Moroni worries here, being a newbie writer, that some will not get it because of his weakness in his writing. Wait, what? Moroni? This is really great stuff. But now we get an interesting irony. You see, Moroni is actually referring to writing in chiasmic poetry, combined with having to write in a totally different language, that tricky reformed Egyptian. But he does what he should and we all should do. He goes to God. And the Lord responds directly here with the main point of the chiasm. Don't worry, Moroni. Fools mock, but they will mourn. Yes, the Lord continues, my meek elect will see past your weakness and they will feel your power and truth. In fact, if all men humble themselves and come to me with their weakness in faith, hope, and love, I will make them strong too. And so with this beautiful truth nugget, Moroni hits the play button again, grabs his popcorn, and finishes the Revengers epic story. And so, as the people reject the wonderful prophet Ether, he relocates to his friendly neighborhood cave for safety. But the Lord tells Ether to go out again and give Coriantumr a final memo. Repent, and the Lord will spare your people and give you his kingdom. Otherwise, he will wipe them out, all of them. And you'll be the only survivor to get to meet the new tenants in my promised land. So what do you say? So Coriantumr repents. No, this isn't Jonah in Nineveh. But soon after, the prophecies begin to come true. And like whack-a-mole, he has to keep beating down whoever wants his power. But finally, he's met his match. As here comes the terrible Shiz, whose brother was killed by Coriantumr. And Shiz won't stop until he's avenged his brother's death. And so now, the entire kingdom divides, half falling Shiz and half falling Coriantumr. And so it begins, with a great and terrible battle and two million people are killed. And as Coriantumr recovers in chapter 15, he finally begins to recall Aether's prophecies, how so many have died for his power. And Coriantumr's heart softens a bit as he writes to Shiz, Okay, I'm now willing to hand over my kingdom if you just spare my people. But that's not enough for Shiz. And now there's a bigger problem. You see, at this point, the people on both sides have been revengers for so long that they are so drunk with anger that this furious raging inferno is now too hot to stop. In fact, both sides begin total warfare as every man, woman, and child gathers for four years, is armed, and made ready to make their last stand. And in only three days, millions more die, until only Shiz and Coriantumr are left. And after Shiz falls, Coriantumr, poetically leaning on his sword for strength, finally beheads Shiz. And so, what did Coriantumr gain? And at what cost? Congrats on retaining the kingdom, but what kingdom? The mud? His epic pride cost everyone everything. And so, when someone hurts us, do we let our grudge fester or fight back? Do we puff up in pride showing we're right, smarter, better, or take control? And while fighting back does feel good and holding the hate may be less violent, we must muster all of our faith to just let it be and give it to God as vengeance belongs to the Lord, and for good reason. And so, like Moroni, Ether gets the fun job of finishing up the record, as Coriantumr meets the Mulekites, this new nation, to take over his once beloved land. Faith is believing in things we cannot see. Moroni shared several examples of people who accomplished great things because of their faith. In Ether, chapter 12, Verses 13 through 15 and 20 through 21, Mormon gives some examples of Alma and Amulek. Their faith caused the prison they were in to crash to the ground. Or Nephi and Lehi, who were able to be powerful missionaries with the Lamanites and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And also Ammon and his brethren, the same thing, powerful missionaries. 
and everyone who has seen Jesus Christ has had great faith, including the brother of Jared. Then Mormon says in Ether chapter 12 verse 6, sorry, Moroni said that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. And then he says, wherefore, don't argue because you don't see something, for you don't get to know something for sure until after you have faith. This means that if we want to know that the commandments are true, we have to first show our faith by being obedient to those commandments. What are some commandments that we should follow and gain a testimony of? How about paying our tithing? Or keeping the Sabbath day holy? Or living the word of wisdom? There's many. Victoria's grandmother had just moved in with the family. Everyone loved having grandmother around, especially Victoria. One day, Victoria asked her grandmother a question. Grandmother, what is faith? That is a very good question, grandmother said. She held up a packet of seeds and asked, do you know what these are? Those are seeds. That's right. And do you know what will happen if you plant these seeds? They will grow, Victoria said. Are you sure? Grandmother asked. Grandmother put the seeds on the table. How do you know these seeds will grow? She asked. Well, I have seen other seeds grow before. But have you ever seen these seeds grow before? No, I haven't seen these seeds grow before. I guess I don't know what will happen. Maybe they won't grow at all. Okay, Grandmother said. Why don't we leave them here on the table and we'll see if they start growing. We can't leave them on the table, Victoria said. They'll never grow if we leave them on the table. Well, what should we do? First, we need a good place to plant the seeds. There were too many rocks in the soil, and it was too rough. So, Victoria moved all the rocks. And she raked the soil until it was just right. Next, we need to plant the seeds down inside the ground. Victoria dug a hole in the soil with a shovel. And she put the seeds in the hole. And then she covered up the seeds with more dirt. Next, the seeds need water and sunlight. Victoria watered the seeds. And the seeds got lots of sunlight. Victoria was 
was getting very tired, but she really believed the seeds would grow. So the next day, Victoria pulled the weeds, and she watered the seeds, and the seeds got lots of sunlight. And the next day, she watered the seeds, and the seeds got lots of sunlight. brings miracles. When we believe in Jesus Christ and act under His name and direction, we can be blessed with miracles in our lives. Keeping the Orphans Warm, based on a true story, in Bristol, England, 1857. George Mueller buried his head in his hands. He had just learned that the large heater in one of his orphanages was broken. What is to be done? George asked himself. I must find warm rooms for 300 children until it is rep repaired. George didn't know what to do, but he did know who to ask for help, his heavenly father. When George was a young man, he didn't really believe in God. He lied and stole money from his friends and family and only read the scriptures because he had to for school. Then one day, George met some people who loved God and tried to follow him. George began to pray every day. He learned that God was real and would answer the prayers of his children. When George Mueller opened his first orphanage in 1836, he wanted to provide a home for children who didn't have parents. He also wanted to share his testimony of God's love. So George decided to trust that God would help him. When George needed money or food, or even jobs for the orphans who had grown up and were ready to leave, he would get on his knees and pray. George had faith that if he prayed to know God's will and then asked for help, God would help him. And God did. Donations and help always came just in time. The children in the orphanages had what they needed, and George helped them see that God loved them. As George looked at the broken heater, he knew this time would be no different. George had faith that God would help. He called workmen to come and fix the heater. But before they could come, a freezing north wind began to blow. George was worried. How would the children stay warm until the heater was fixed? Then George remembered a story from the Bible where the walls of Jerusalem were built quickly because the builders had a mind to work. George got on his knees and began to pray. Lord, said George, would you be pleased to change the north wind to a south wind? And would you give the workmen a mind to work? 
When George woke on the morning of the repairs, the weather had changed. Even though it was December, a warm south wind was blowing. The children would be warm and wouldn't need a fire while the heater was being fixed. The, re the repairs could begin. The workmen spent all day trying to fix the heater, but there was too much work to finish in one day. At the end of the day, George went down to the cellar of the orphanage. The man in charge of the workers told George, The men will work late this evening and come very early again tomorrow. George nodded. He hoped the weather would stay good until then. Then one of the workers spoke up. We would rather, sir, work all night, he said. George smiled. He remembered how he had prayed that the men would have a mind to work hard and finish the repairs as quickly as possible. By morning, the heater was fixed and the orphanage was warm and snug before winter winds returned. George knew that God had answered his prayer. George Mueller helped more than 10,000 orphans during his life. He trusted that when he served God and others, God would always help him. He wrote, I have never been permitted to doubt during the last 69 years that I am a child of God and that I am beloved of God. Jesus Christ is our Savior. A 12-year-old girl lay in her bed, growing sicker and sicker. Her parents watched helplessly. They could do nothing to save her. Then they remembered amazing stories they had heard about a man living among them named Jesus. People said he could heal the sick and make blind people see. Maybe he could save their daughter's life. The girl's father, Jarius, ran to find Jesus. He begged Jesus to heal his daughter. Then a message came with terrible news. It was too late. The girl had already died. Be not afraid, Jesus said to Jarius. Only believe. When Jesus and Jarius arrived at Jarius' house, they went into the room where the girl was lying. Jesus took the girl by the hand and told her to arise. When she stood up, her parents were amazed. Jesus had brought their daughter back to life. That day, Jesus showed how much he cared for the girl and her family by blessing them. Jesus shows how much he cares for us in many wonderful and amazing ways. He helped create the beautiful world and all its plants and animals. He volunteered to come to earth to be our Savior, even though he knew it would be very hard. He spent his life on earth blessing, healing, and teaching others. He lived a perfect life. He willingly suffered for our sins in the Garden of, Geth Garden of Gethsemane and died on the cross so we can learn, grow, and will one day live with our Heavenly Father again. Jesus performed many miracles during his life, such as feeding large groups of thousands of people with only a small amount of food. He miraculously produced food for all those people, or making people so that they could walk again when they couldn't walk before, or raising people from the dead, or casting out evil spirits, or calming the weather itself, or making the blind so that they can see again. Jesus performed many miracles during his day, and miracles continue to happen in our time, too. Jesus Christ can help me be strong. We will all face situations in life where we feel weak, but Moroni learned that the Savior can make weak things become strong. In Ether 12, 27, it says that God gives us weaknesses, that we will be humble, and his grace is enough so that those who humble themselves before him and have faith in him, that the Lord will make those weak things strong unto them. Although we all have weaknesses and shortcomings, we can be strengthened by Jesus Christ and his atonement. Weak Things Stronger Parker liked lots of things, music, art, rocks, cool shapes, but his favorite thing was riding his dirt bike. He loved racing over hills on his bike. He wanted to be the best racer ever. But no matter how hard he tried, he never was. As he zoomed over dirt hills and across winding trails, it looked like he wouldn't be the best in this race either. Parker crossed the finish line and braked to a stop, kicking up a cloud of dust behind him. 
He heard his family cheering as he squinted up at the scoreboard. Parker felt his stomach clench. Eighth place! You did great, Dad said, clapping Parker on the back. No, I didn't, Parker dumped his helmet on the ground. Last time you got tenth, Mom said. You're doing better every time. It doesn't matter, Parker almost shouted. I'll never get anywhere close to winning. He threw his gloves on the ground, too. Cumulus, Mom said. Cumulus was the code word that helped Parker calm down. When Mom or Dad said that word, Parker closed his eyes, pictured a big puffy cloud, and did the breathing exercises Mom and Dad taught him. Usually it worked. Parker didn't really want to think of clouds right now, but he closed his eyes anyway. He breathed in for five seconds, he held it for five seconds, and then he breathed out for five seconds. He did it over and over until he felt a little better. When they got home, Parker tried to calm himself down by playing the piano. He sat down at the piano and started playing a song he knew. He liked it when he could play it perfectly, but today he messed up at the end. Parker slammed his fist onto the keys. The jarring notes rang in his ears. Mom came in from the other room. What's wrong? I can't do anything right, Parker said. Mom sat down on the piano bench and put her arm around Parker's shoulders. I'm sorry you feel so frustrated today. She picked up the Book of Mormon on the top of the piano. One of my favorite scriptures is Ether 12:27. Can we read it together? She turned to the right page and handed it to Parker. My grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me, Parker read. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Mom smiled. I like that promise. It reminds me that Jesus Christ can help me with my weaknesses. Parker nodded. He liked that promise, too. You know, you are good at so many things, Mom said, but something you struggle with is being patient with yourself. It takes time to learn and grow and get better, and it's okay to not be the best at something. Mom gave Parker a hug. That made him feel a little better. Heavenly Father and Jesus can help you be patient with yourself, Mom said, with piano and dirt bike. The next day, Parker tried playing a new song. The first part was easy, but he kept messing up in the middle. He was almost ready to throw his music book on the floor, but he stopped. He pictured fluffy white clouds and breathed slowly in and out. It's okay, Parker told himself. He could be patient and kind to himself. He looked at the picture of Jesus on the piano and thought of the promise his mom had read. I'm getting a little bit better every day. What's a weakness that you might have? Think about some things that maybe you could do better at that right now you're not that great at. And now think of how you can ask the Lord for help and what you can do to seek the Savior's help to become strong. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. The Book of Mormon Ether chapter 12, verse 27. Hope is like an anchor to our souls. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we can have a hope for a better world. Just like it says in Ether 12:4, where it said, Whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God. Which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. What are some other words that mean hope, or different words for hope? Can you think of some? And then, what are some words that are opposite of hope? The list on the left are the things that we should try to have in our own lives. Those kind of things lead you to a happier life. The list on the right 
are the things that will lead you to an unhappy life. What do we hope God will provide in response to our spiritual longing? Even as we speak, we are waging an all-hands-on-deck war with COVID-19, a solemn reminder that a virus a thousand times smaller than a grain of sand can bring entire populations and global economies to their knees. When we have conquered this, and we will, may we be equally committed to freeing the world from the virus of hunger and free neighborhoods and nations from the virus of poverty. May we hope for schools where students are taught, not terrified they will be shot, and for the gift of personal dignity for every child of God, unmarred by any form of racial, ethnic, or religious prejudice. Undergirding all of this is our relentless hope for greater devotion to the two greatest of all commandments, to love God by keeping his counsel, and to love our neighbors by showing kindness, compassion, patience, and forgiveness. We all need to believe that what we desire in righteousness can someday, some way, somehow, yet be ours. Indeed, if we finally lose hope, we lose our last sustaining possession. It was over the very gate of hell that Dante wrote a warning to all those traveling through his Divina Commedia. Abandon all hope, he said, ye who enter here. Truly, when hope is gone, what we have left is the flame of the inferno raging on every side. We can hope. We should hope. Even when facing the most insurmountable odds. So, when our backs are to the wall, and as the hymn says, other helpers fail and comforts flee, among our most indispensable virtues will be this precious gift of hope, linked inextricably to our faith in God and our charity to others. I testify that the future is going to be as miracle-filled and bountifully blessed as the past has been. We have every reason to hope for blessings even greater than those we've already received. And that concludes this week's lesson. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Our closing song will be Choose the Right Way from the Michelle Howell YouTube channel.